by Post Post's most popular work up to date in terms of written books is the action formula. And the action formula, it has to do with procrastination. And to be completely honest with you, I don't believe we intentionally procrastinate on things. It's just that we don't know how to move forward with action. And so I believe procrastination is just action that's being blocked versus an action that just flows without any kind of resistance. And so anyway, long story short, I care a lot about solving other people's procrastination issues simply because I think the world is a better place when more people do things and the things that they do impact the others around them and then that's how the world sees more motion. So I want to see more motion in the world, so I'm interested in solving that problem. That's a little bit of a background, but now, these days, I've been watching a lot of casual YouTube uh, just for my own entertainment and surfing purposes. And uh, there is a professional Tekken, which is a fighting game, gamer that I subscribe on YouTube. And uh, this gamer was playing a video game that's sort of popular in Korea and Japan at the moment. It's called Exit Number 8. And the thing is, um, the game is actually very, very simple. It's a, it's a game that features a liminal space. So it's like this repeated underground subway passageway. And all you have to do is just walk towards exit number eight. And but now here's the thing with this game. Whether you go forward or backward in this underground tunnel, the pattern keeps on repeating. So it's, that's the first kind of unsettling thing because the more you walk, the more you expect the environment to change, but it doesn't. That's number one. And number two, the rule of the game is actually really simple. Number one, uh, you first, you have, uh, the end goal is to reach exit number eight, but as you progress, if there is an anomaly, you have to turn back. If there isn't an anomaly, you push forward. And how do you know if you made the right choice or not? The exit number will reset. So for example, I am currently at exit number zero. I keep walking and then I don't notice any anomaly, so I keep walking forward. And now I meet exit number one, which means I was right, there were no anomalies. And I keep moving forward in this tunnel. And then suppose, I didn't notice anything, so I moved forward, but then now there was something wrong, so now I'm back at exit zero. So the game kind of repeats itself and resets to zero unless you make uh, the correct decision about whether there's an anomaly or not um, eight times in a row. And now, what are the anomalies? The anomalies are really, literally anomalies, and they're kind of really benign. But because of the design of this game, where everything is kind of in this liminal place, it's so unsettling. For example, uh, one of the doors that are next to the tunnel will be ever so slightly hinged, and there's going to be a figure in there, in the dark, watching you. But they don't do anything. It's just open. Another example is you walk, and then, again, one of the doors is just completely open and it's dark. But it just opens as you walk by it. But that's the only thing. And the other thing is, you know, for example, you walk and then the posters on the wall, they get gradually, but ever so slightly bigger. And as you progress through the um, tunnel, there's always this one repeated person who walks towards you, but on a, on a path of his own. He has a briefcase and he approaches you from the, all the way to the end, he walks towards you, but then goes his, ultimately goes his own way. And now one of the anomalies is he looks at you as you walk and starts to come close to you instead of walking his path. So there's like, uh, there's like 20 something anomalies and 
they all have their varying levels of um unsettlingness. And I'm watching this professional gamer uh watch I play this horror game, so to speak. And this gamer is notorious for being bad at playing horror games because he gets scared very easily. And now something interesting I've noticed is when he is about to turn the corner and notices one of the anomalies, the first thing he does is press the escape button and can't continue. So there's this really big aspect of being completely blocked. You can't do anything. And so he has to continue. So he presses escape and He's look up. Uh, he's he just needs to turn the corner and make an informed decision. Just gotta turn the corner, see if everything's all right or not. That's the only thing this person has to do. But he just can't turn the corner, and so here he is, just lingering and just spying and like constantly thinking. Oh my god, I, I need, I can't do this. I can't play this game. I can't finish this game. I I don't know what to do. I, I just, I can't move. And so there's this element of paralyzing fear. And you know what's so weird? Is that this person plays at the highest levels of um, his primary game. So where other people would choke, where other people would be so nervous, he's so used to having clutch moments because he doesn't get nervous because he's been so nervous and you know he's been on big stages so many times world final like you know uh, competitions that's like his life and yet in this simple video game where you just have to cut the corner and look at things he can't just turn the corner and i thought that was so interesting and now because of that, I've been pondering about this phenomenon of being completely blocked by this paralyzing fear. And I thought, hmm, that is, in a way, a blocked action. And so I noticed, I tried to notice where in my life I have had those experiences. When have I been truly stuck? And now, uh, some of you may know that I am I used to be, well, I kind of still am, but I used to be deathly afraid of cockroaches. And just the mere idea of cockroaches was just enough to send me into a frenzy. And more of you may know, uh, might know that I had a roach problem in this house, right? And so there was this one particular restroom. There was no other place in the house where we had this problem. But in one restroom, there was a roach and how we found out was my wife was taking a shower and she noticed a roach was climbing up the wall and she screamed and i was just in the other room like casually chilling and i was like whoa, whoa, whoa what's wrong because i didn't know what was happening and so since that moment we've been trying to do so many we've tried so many different approaches in addressing this roach problem we're over it now, but it took like a good two, three years of our troubleshooting and problem solving in order to completely eradicate this roach problem. Which means throughout that time, whenever I tried to open that restroom door, I was completely paralyzed. So we just stopped using that restroom and that was good because um you know like okay so no need to deal with this we're we're just gonna pretend that this space doesn't exist but every once in a while we would have guests so we have a need to use this room and so if my parents came i'd be like oh cool dad you're not afraid of bugs at all can you take care of the roaches in there and my dad would just like look at me with this profound confusion like why is this kid such a wuss but anyway um 
or we will have some stuff in the we purchased that's in the big restroom and we need to get it out so occasionally every once in a blue moon we would need to go to that restroom and so i wasn't gonna let my wife do it so i'm there i'm holding on to my heart all I need to do is just open the door because the exterminators come every uh, regularly, every two months. So every time they spray and they notice that all the roaches inside the restroom are dead. They don't know where they come from because every time I give them the whole tour of all the contraptions that we made to make this room roach proof, they, they can't tell where they come from, but they're still coming somewhere. But they're always dead, right? So I know that. I know that when I open the door, there will be roaches that are dead. Or there might not be. Who knows? But that idea of on the other side of this door, there's this cosmic horror happening. And in front of that door, I find myself utterly paralyzed because I don't know what to do. Do it. And another incident of paralyzing fear is uh, in my third Jiu Jitsu competition. So I competed three times, and the first one I competed at my first time. I had no expectations. I'm not an athletic person at all. I just went to check it out, and then boom, uh, lost two matches in a row. I was out. And um, yeah, that was just it. But now I kind of got the sense of what a competition is like and how it's so different from my regular training. Cool. But I wanted, at the time, I wanted to continue kind of applying myself. So I went to my second competition. Still very nervous. But now the thing is, um, I won silver. Yay. Really good, right? And now um, I register for my third competition. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Time for my third. And what starts happening inside of my mind? If I don't get gold, that means I haven't improved, right? And there's this high level of expectation that I set on myself and therefore high level of pressure that I set on myself because I really, like, above everything, I can't accept this possibility of regressing. Because I'm spending a lot of time at the gym, right? And my coaches are really good, right? And my instructor is like one of the best in the world. And I don't want to let them down. Not that they're going to be let down by someone like me. But I don't want to let them down. And moreover, I don't want to let myself let down. So I have to progress. And not only do I do jiu-jitsu, I do judo as well. So my stand-up has to be good, right? So I'm all doing all of these things to address and improve my you know, jujitsu. So if I can't get a gold medal, that just means I, 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 I just can't let that happen, right? And so the more I set myself up for the impossibility of defeat and failure, the higher the stakes become. And now I had this really, on the day of the competition, I couldn't stand up straight. Like, my legs were just shivering. I tried all these things to calm my nerves down, but nothing worked. I just couldn't let my nerves down. And throughout the match, I know that I needed to use my legs to push this other person. But my legs, I could, I could feel the electricity, like, nerves shooting down, but there would be no power. Like, the muscles just, like, deactivated completely. And after the match, um, the, after the first match, which I lost by points, I lost consciousness. And so when people say, oh, I lost consciousness in a jiu-jitsu tournament, you, people think you got choked out. But um, no, I wasn't choked out. There was no choke down on me. But my pressure and the stress that I accumulated, it just shut my body down. And I woke up, everything was just done. So, I know that this paralyzing fear is actually 
literally paralyzing. It just takes away your government of your body. And I don't think that this kind of a fear is talked about enough when it comes to blocked action. So why don't people do things? Why do people procrastinate? And maybe this is just my personal take, but I believe there are other legitimate reasons for procrastination, more uh, legitimate, like perfectionism or, you know, um, I uh, want to do a good job and um, I, you know, like, or I need all these resources to get started. So like doing a bunch of prep and prep and prep and prep, all, all that. And um, other other thing is like, uh, I really don't want to do it. And so like, there's always all these like tedious reasons of why I can't do it because, um, you know, it's not easy. It's so hard. And uh, I don't want to make do hard things or like, I don't see the point of this and such. Those are more or less the legitimate reasons for kind of um, procrastination or delayed action. But now, fear is a major component of it. And um, I also noticed a lot of fear when it comes to business coaching. So this December, I ran a mon entire month-long um, business coaching program. And in this business coaching program, I see so many people um, struggling to launch an offer, struggling to talk about their offer struggling to be on camera and talk of talking about them um you know whether it be on youtube or instagram struggling to kind of announce things why again because of paralyzing fear that fear just won't let you advance and so i was talking a little bit and uh, uh w about this with my wife and trying to reflect upon it so i asked my wife how do we get to this state of being completely stuck? Why do we get here in the first place? And my wife's offering was, we, we reach a point where all the paths just lead to that one door because you have desires to go to what's on the other side of that door, right? So for me, now that I think about it, now that I reflect back on it, if all this stuff is in the big restroom and I need to take care of it, I can just order new ones from Amazon, right? But that possibility doesn't cross my mind. So why doesn't it cross my mind? It's because in the end, I want full ownership of my house, right? I don't want to be constantly plagued by this roach problem. So I want to overcome this problem. And in order to get proof of the overcoming, I need to verify that roaches do not in fact exist. And so in order for me to get that confirmation, I need to open that door. But I can't. Because I'm so afraid. Because I'm so fearful of this panic-inducing existence of cockroaches. So... All the roads in my life lead me to this one door. And um, this one door, I think, is such an interesting kind of a metaphor for this paralyzing uh, sensation. And it's really well depicted in terms of a symbolism in the manga Chainsaw Man. So if you don't know, Chainsaw Man is a comic uh, series in, that's in publication in Japan right now. And um, it got very popular last year because it was animated. I, was it last year? Maybe last last year. But anyway, it was animated, so it uh, became very popular. So I checked it out. And um, it, 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 it's literally what it sounds like. Uh, it's this person who fused with the devil of the chainsaw and is ha now half chainsaw like chainsaws come out of the skull hands are chainsaws legs are chainsaws like it's literally chainsaw man i know it's crazy but um anyway in this world there are devils and there are humans 
and devils obviously want to eat humans and humans want to kill devils and so in this world there's this like constant strength between the devils and the humans and in this work doors are a constant theme so when the protagonist enters hell in the series hell is just full of doors and each door just opens the possibility of a specific devil so for example uh, the dog devil or the um, strangulation devil or like famine devil and um, depending on the impact of that thing in the world the devils are stronger and weaker so for example um a puppy dog a puppy devil would be really weak because puppy doesn't really inspire a lot of fear but for example um rabies devil would be a lot more because people are more afraid of rabies and such but then the greater important point is not that all the devils are behind the door and the so many big moments of in the story arcs happen behind the door so the protagonist is always forced at a door so is he gonna open it or not what happens if he opens it what happens if, if he doesn't so the in the uh, an, uh, in the animated feature chainsaw man doors are always a key feature and uh, another work where doors are a key feature is the pixar film monsters inc right because monsters inc the bedroom door is again a gateway for children's nightmares right so in that sense it's very similar to chainsaw man but that possibility of what happens outside the door is such a crazy kind of a symbolism and i think doors have always served as a uh, this divider and at the same time entryway across two different realms and um so normally doors would be like front gate to the house into the house from the uh, that distinguish the outside and the inside and for me it's in the same house it's the restroom door so but the division the paradox of being this divider and at the same time entryway allows for so many intricate um tricks in our minds and now um in terms of these doors what can we do in order to address this like action that's behind the doors well one of the things that we can do is try to reframe how doors actually are thought right and um what really in, what's really interesting is different cultures have different interpretations of doors right and so uh, across different cultures there's also different materials for doors and how the doors are designed and um, placed what you know direction should they be in those are all kind of like really important factors for doors and um so I'm, i've been trying to kind of look at the different types of doors in different cultures and trying to get some innate human wisdom um from that in order to tackle this kind of fear that in, uh, is inspired by these uh doors and what's beyond them according to my research um i know at least for korean doors we have uh wooden beams and uh they're typically sliding doors and uh, the wooden beams are just kind of like uh, covered with the paper. And so it's a combination of paper and uh, wood. That's the kind of a divider between rooms. And the greater kind of the doorway to enter the house in the first place from the outside is generally like a really large wooden um, hinge double door and um that's how doors usually work in korean but in the the paper aspect is interesting because as a kid we would always used to poke holes on them so we can peek outside which is another really interesting characteristic of doors right we 
have peak holes in modern doors because we want to while keeping the separation we want more knowledge about what's on the other side of things and so i think that kind of like inquisitive nature while trying to preserve the distance and separation is also uh really worthy of noting about the door and um uh, yeah so we can using the korean kind of wisdom we can try to poke holes and we can use these peoples and try and see like trying to have these openings that are manageable for our kind of um sanity i can't widely open the doors yet because i'm too scared and but you, you know what i can always do is i can always like wet the paper a little bit and then kind of try to poke a hole and see what's inside so i can get some knowledge around it um that's the korean way and uh, according to my knowledge in islamic culture um doors and doorways are often intricate geometric geometric patterns and calligraphy and the uh, entry door to the mosque is a uh, mihrab and is positioned to face mecca and so this gives us the insight that you know um doors are ultimately placed by our intention and so whatever door you're afraid of opening if you can understand that this door was placed by you in the first place to draw an arbitrary uh, separation, you can be more comfortable because you kind of define what's outside and what's inside. So why not move the door a little bit out and then you can play with that kind of placement of the door. And um, Chinese cultures have circular door knockers, which are traditional symbol symbols of protection. So again, another kind of a important aspect of doors is protecting. And um, threshold in Indian culture, thresholds are considered sacred and often adorned with colorful Bengali designs. So again, separations is a big feature. Here's something I found interesting in Native American culture. Uh, traditional Native American dwellings such as teepees and hogans have symbolic doorways often facing east to welcome the morning sun. And doorways are seen to the seen as portals to the spirit world. And so, again, uh, something that differentiates between our physical realm and the spirit realm. And the entryway is the door, right? So the door always serves as both a barricade and an opening. And uh, another thing I found very interesting is in Mayan culture. Uh, in Mayan architecture, doorways are often small and narrow with low um, lintels, symbolizing a connection with the, between the earthly and the spiritual realms. And carvings and inscriptions on doorways held st uh, significant religious and historical meanings. So this I found very interesting as well because um, you're not only connected, connecting to different realms, you're also connecting the door itself to a ground. And that gives you some more wisdom around, okay, so the door is, again, part of the earth, right? Part of the landscape that you have created for yourself. And so um, if you can lean into that feeling of the door, door's not suspended midair, door's always on the ground. And if you can draw that kind of a grounding energy of the surface, then um, you can get some more power from that door as well. And um, another thing to note is uh, in Middle Eastern cultures, particularly in Morocco, um, doors to homes often have symbolic designs such as the hand of Fatima or Hamsa to ward off evil. And so warding off evil and good fortune are also like a very key feature in doors across different, um, across different cultures in the world. And now that got me kind of wondering um if there are cultures truly without doors um if you do know of such please let me know i'm just genuinely interested and curious about this okay so to wrap up i want to give one more kind of a observation that i had with doors and the observation is this happened for me and the gamer as well when the decision to open the door is made, we hold our breath and try to speed run through it. There's no being calm. There's no taking things slow. When you're making the commitment, you, you hold your breath, which means 
you're kind of stopping your life flow. The, you're stopping your flow of life throughout that process. And moreover, you're speed running through it. And it just means that you're temporarily trying to not be alive through this experience. And this happened for me too. As I was trying to, you know, okay, you know what? I'm going to open the door. And there's no like, hmm, okay, I'm going to see what's happened. Oh, dead roach here, dead roach here. Nothing like that. It was just... And then get out as soon as possible, right? I temporarily kind of stop everything except for the basic thing required for survival. And so, we just want to perhaps do the opposite of that. What if we contemplated more around, okay, so why? Why does this thing temporarily require me to surrender my life? And is my surrender of my life truly necessary? I'm, I'm giving this thing this much power. I'm literally offering my life to this abstract entity that lives in my head. And that gravity may help you assess things in a different way. Like, is this worth it? And moreover, what's the opposite of temporarily suspending your you know, life and life force? It's to breathe through and connecting to the observing part, connecting to the feeling part of things, right? When you're truly into something, when you're truly focused on something, you don't even recognize that you're breathing. You're just kind of in the zone, right? And that is like living. So in a sense, it's so similar. The extreme um, commitment to moving through this uh, fear as you're kind of temporarily dead and being so alive that you don't even notice you're alive are on they're like such a it's such a thin coin and it just has two sides and that kind of a intricate relationship and the paradoxical nature of being in something and in so much life and being completely paralyzed by death and the possibilities of death. If you can merge that coin and learn how to hold both together, I really think that could open up so many new possibilities for you. Because usually, again, what's on the other side of that door? It's fear. But that door is there for a reason. Every path in your life has led you to that door. Oof. Okay, well, that concludes uh, this episode, which was a little bit different from the previous ones. But um, anyways, if you're enjoying this uh, podcast, please let me know in the comments, uh, whether it be Substack or um, YouTube or anywhere else you're consuming this. And uh, if you have any feedback for me, please let me know at billy at julylifecoach.com. Thank you for listening or watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.